Good evening, this is Joy Rapp. I wanted to say hello to you as we begin class tonight. Um, I've got uh, three main passages I'm going to go through. Uh, Psalm 73. Um, let me get my notes here. Matt, Acts 7 and 8. And then um, uh, 2 Samuel 18 through 19. Um, I want to start with a story the friend of mine shared. Uh, he was a minister in a church in England. And there was a woman who used to come outside and stand outside and be with them and, and talk to them. And she always asked for money. And um, uh, when people rejected, she would become abusive and aggressive and angry. Uh, well, she died. And because she had no, no heir to anything, um, he wound up doing her funeral as well. But in the process, he found out that she had inherited a large fortune. She had a nice home. She had a lot of uh, valuable paintings. But she chose to live on the streets with her plastic bags full of trash. She could not bring herself to leave behind the life she knew. And she never enjoyed her inheritance. Some people are afraid of change, while others believe change isn't even possible. Yet the wonderful news is that God with God's help, we can change. This change is key to spiritual life, growth, and transformation. It is not just about changing our actions or appearance, while that is, is important too. We need to change on the inside. We need a change of heart. So how does this happen? Well, first we have to get God's perspective. Have you ever wondered whether your faith was really worth your time? Have you ever looked around at very successful people who have no faith and wondered whether, whether or not they're better off than you? And you've been tempted to be envious of them? The psalmist has kept his heart pure, as it says in verse 1 of, of, seven, of, of 73. But he has found life extremely tough. He has had his struggles and been plagued by temptation, doubt, fears, and anxiety of mind. He looks around in an affluent world and it seems to be doing very well without God and he almost slips, it says in verse 2. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. You may see people around who are rich, some rich and successful. In spite of their callous hearts, they seem not to have any struggles and it seems like that's not even fair. They seem perfectly healthy and free from burdens. They are proud and arrogant and appear to have no need for God. If you find yourself on that path of doubt and despair, wondering whether you've kept your heart pure in vain, then this psalm tells you what to do. As we see, everything changes when we enter the sanctuary of God and see things from God's perspective. The psalmist had a complete change of heart. He understood their final destiny. He realized the difference between their destiny and his. The psalm starts, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. And it ends, But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. Then we also think about what it means to change in, in the sense there's a lot in the Old Testament and the New Testament uh, and, and I would say we need to talk about circumcision of the heart. Uh, do you ever look around uh, to people who are opposed to Christianity and, and wonder if they could ever change? Uh, in today's passage in Acts 7 we see even the most hardened opponent can have a change of heart. Before I begin this, I want to uh, I remember a story from uh, when I was a child. Uh, we lived in a, another town and another place, and my father was the preacher there. And uh, there was a man who was, what I would say, wild and uh, known for getting around in town and things like that. I'll let you figure that out. Uh, but he met a young lady who went to our, uh, the church where, where my dad preached and uh, decided he really wanted to spend the rest of his life with her. And she quickly said, unless you have faith, I have no interest in you. And so he began to really dig into that. I know that sounds kind of harsh, but I mean, you have to understand he was kind of a harsh man. And, and so 
uh, he begins to study with her and he studies with my dad. Um, and then one Sunday he's baptized. Uh, that could be the end of a great story because he went on to be a missionary for a few years in Africa. But the part that hurt me was that Christian people, when I walked out the door that morning, there were two men standing there as though taking bets, the over and under how long he would last. Once I give him six weeks, I said, I'll give him six months. Uh, how sad is that, that even God's people don't even believe there's a real change? It, to be a Jew in this, day, in this time meant physical circumcision. Every male was circumcised on the eighth day of his life. But physical circumcision was intended only to symbolize circumcision of the heart. Uh, as Stephen's speech comes to an end, with great courage and boldness, he says to his accusers, you stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears. Now, remember, he's speaking to Jews. Uh, you are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. He then accuses them of being the Jesus murderers. Uh, one main theme runs through Stephen's speech. God is not restricted to any one place. The Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. Neither the tabernacle nor the temple could ever be viewed as God's home in a literal sense. For as God says through Isaiah, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Jesus came to replace the tabernacle and temple. Before Jesus, people would come to the temple to meet God. With Jesus coming, the meeting place with God would be Jesus himself. Now through the Holy Spirit, God is present with his people in Matthew 18. It is especially in the gathered community, the church, that God lives by his spirit. By his spirit, he dwells within each of us. Our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit. God's dwelling is now in Stephen, who is full of the Holy Spirit. Stephen is speaking to the priests and people standing around and talking to them about the very temple that has now been superseded by Jesus through the Holy Spirit. So it is not surprising that they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him, maybe a little bit concerned about their jobs. They drag him out of the city and begin to stone him. One of the people with an uncircumcised heart, one of the people with an uncircumcised heart is a young man named Saul. The ringleader took off all their coats uh, and asked a young man named Saul to watch them. In the message, it says that in verse 58, very loosely. He was right there congratulating the killers. This young man, Saul, began to destroy the church, going from house to house, dragging men and women out of their homes and putting them into prison. It would be hard to find anyone in human history who had a bigger change of heart than this young man. From being a murderer of Christians he became a great apostle who preached all over the world that Jesus is the Son of God. Imagine if a former member of ISIS ended up being, let's just say the Pope. Uh, that would be about as close as we could say to understanding what happened to Apostle Paul. Now, that's what's going on here is that there's this radical transformation of, of Paul, Saul to Paul. When did this change of heart begin? Uh, probably, uh, well, I can't say probably, perhaps was planted when uh, he saw Stephen's death. Because Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God said, Look, I, he, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. We had said this. He fell asleep. Later, this same Saul became known as Paul. And he would write, A person is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit. To circumcise is to cut off. Every true Christian is circumcised by the Holy Spirit. When your heart is circumcised, you seek to cut off every wrong attitude that comes into your heart and mind. Say no to anything that will stop your heart from being right before God. Like Stephen, be filled with the Holy Spirit, overflowing with love, courage, and forgiveness. And our last thought uh, it comes from Samuel, 2 Samuel 18 into all the way into almost all of 19. 
uh, and it's maturity through suffering. Are you in a period of suffering and grief right now? Uh, I think it's safe to say that our whole country probably is, and maybe our whole world. Uh, this pandemic has just about worn us all out. God often uses times like these, though, to change our, our hearts and increase our compassion for others. Um, if there's something we need more than anything else, especially in the United States, it's compassion for others. David's heart was purified through suffering and grief. As if he had not suffered enough up until this point, he receives the news that his son Absalom has been murdered, killed. He's heartbroken. He cries out, oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. I mean, he, he's rolling around weeping for this child who just before this war was trying to kill his own dad. But the father is just heartbroken because he did not want his son to die. He is then told in no uncertain terms by Joab that he has to pull himself together and go out and encourage his troops who have just won a great battle for him against the enemies. Joab tells David, put some heart into your servants. That's from the message. David changes his attitude. He gets up and does exactly what he has been asked to do. He won over the hearts of all the men of Judah as though they were one man. Not only did David have a change of heart, Shammai did as well. He prostrates himself before the king and he says, may the Lord not hold me guilty. Do not remember how your servant did wrong. For I, your servant, know that I have sinned. But today I have come here as the first of the whole house of Joseph to come down and meet my Lord, the king. David, purified by his suffering, shines out like a brilliant light all around him. He had mercy on Shammai, and he deals wisely with Mephibosheth and Ziba and, and Barzillai. Dave, but David is going to face more battles ahead as a war of words breaks out over and between Israel and Judah. Man, it, it you know, he has a moment where he just gets clarity because someone kind of slaps him back into reality. But um, through all these verses, uh, and I, I just hope that you'll take the time to see that you can change, that God has a different perspective than what the world gives us, and that we sometimes grow in some of our worst times. So that's what I've got tonight. I hope you have a, a, a great evening. Uh, I look forward to when we can all be back together again and, and be together and to love on each other and even to hug and shake hands and high five and, and not be concerned about, you know, spreading a disease. I hope you have a, as I said before, I hope you have a great evening. May God bless you and be a blessing to his community. Bye.